This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case is going to take us to several different locations, but it's going to start in a small community known as Blue Mountain, Alabama. And that's going to be close to Anniston, Alabama, and in fact was later annexed by Anniston. If you listen to episode five on Marie Hilly, she was also born in Blue Mountain. The population in Blue Mountain in 1910 was 528, and the population in 2007 was 236, so not a real large progressive community. And although it's known as Blue Mountain, it's not a vast or large mountain, but really a foothill to the Appalachian Mountains. In 2003, part of the Blue Mountain community was annexed by Anniston, as I mentioned, and the rest became a part of unincorporated Calhoun County. And for perspective, Anniston, the city that kind of took in this part of the Blue Mountain community, has a total population of 22,000. And born in Blue Mountain was Nancy Hazel, born to James and Louisa Hazel. And although her name was Nancy, she was always known as Nanny. Nanny did not like her father, and she described him as mean, controlling, and there was some talk that he was abusive. Her schooling was not consistent as her father kept her and her four siblings out of school and they were required to work on the family farm. She reported that she never really learned to read very well due to this. She also stated that when she was seven, she was riding a train with her family and it made a sudden stop, kind of a jolting stop, and it forced her to hit her head on a metal bar. She attributed years of headaches, blackouts, and depressions to that incident on the train. Her father was conservative and refused to let her or her sisters wear makeup or any type of revealing clothing. They weren't permitted to attend social gatherings or any other normal you know, childhood age functions like that. And the father said that he did this to protect them from others. Now, Nanny described her mother as loving and kind. Nanny first got married in 1921 to Charlie Braggs, who worked at a local factory in Anniston. They dated only a few months, and then they got married when Nanny was 16, but her father allowed her to do this. Most people believe Nanny married so young in order to get out of her abusive home. Charlie was an only child, so Nanny, Charlie, and Charlie's mother all lived together. Nanny kind of felt the mom was an intrusion because she wanted all of Charlie's time and wanted his attention, and Nanny felt that was taking away from her. Now, during the four-year time span from 1923 to 1927, Nanny and Charlie had four daughters. But by the time the fourth one came along, Nanny was unhappy and she had begun drinking. In 1927, the two middle daughters died from a suspected food poisoning after breakfast. When this happened, Charlie, for whatever reason, decided to take their oldest daughter, Melvina, and leave Nanny. Now, the youngest daughter was a newborn. Her name was Florine, and she stayed with Nanny. Also around this same time frame, Charlie's mother had died. So Nanny goes to work supporting herself and her infant, and she began working at a local cotton mill. A year after Charlie left Nanny with Melvina, he returned back to Blue Mountain with another woman. Charlie and Nanny divorced, and Charlie remarried this new love, and Nanny got Melvina back. Nanny took both of her daughters and went to live with her mother. So Nanny's working to support herself and her daughters, but she wants a man in her life. So she placed an ad in the Lonely Hearts column. If you've not ever heard of this, it's the newspaper or magazine version of 
a singles website. So people would place an ad in this, describing themselves, what they were looking for, and they could meet up with other people. It's 1920smatch.com. Yes, that's a good way to describe it. Well, this is how she met Robert, who went by Frank Harrelson. Frank was working in a factory, but he lived in Jacksonville, Alabama, which was about a 20-minute drive from Nanny's home in Blue Mountain. So, 1929, Nanny was now 24 years old. She had been divorced, and she was now in love with Frank Harrelson. He would write her romance poetry, and she really loved this about him. So, Nanny moved to Jacksonville with Frank and brought along her two daughters. But not long after they were married, Nanny discovered Frank wasn't all about the romance poetry. Frank was an alcoholic, and he had even previously been arrested for assault. So this wasn't exactly the romance she was looking for, but they stayed married for about 16 years. And in the early 1940s, Nanny's eldest daughter, Melvina, the one that she regained custody of when her husband came back with a new woman, gave birth to a baby girl. And unfortunately, that baby girl died shortly after birth. Melvina told her husband and sister that she saw Nanny stick a hat pin into the infant's head. Reports say Melvina had just given birth and was on pain medication, and so they weren't sure if she was saw this for real or if it was just a side effect due to the medication. If this did happen and Nanny stuck a hat pin in this baby's head, Melvina did not report it to police, but allegedly told her younger sister. We found no records. I mean, this case is is so old that we couldn't find any records that said one way or the other as far as a cause of death for that infant girl. But Melvina also had a toddler son, Robert Hayes, and Nanny had helped care for Robert, but he died at about two years old. Melvina had gone to visit her father and left Robert with Nanny, Now, why she would leave this child with her mother if she felt that her mother had stuck a hat pin in her infant daughter's head kind of leads us to believe that that may not have been true. It may have been a side effect of the medication or, you know, because we were unable to verify it. And And it doesn't seem likely that she would have left another child in Nanny's charge. Robert died in 1945, and his cause of death was asphyxia from unknown causes. We later learned that Nanny had a $500 life insurance payout on Robert. And also in 1945, her husband of 16 years, Frank, passed away as well. Nanny later said that Frank came home drunk and forced her to have sex with him. The next day, she said she found his moonshine that he thought he had hid from her. She stated that she added rat poison to the moonshine, and that is how Frank had died. Frank is dead, so Nanny needs a new love interest. She's lonely again. She meets Arlie Lanning from Lexington, North Carolina, through a Lonely Hearts ad, and they married within a few days of meeting. But Nanny soon learns things about Arlie she didn't like. He was an alcoholic, he was a serial cheater, and he liked to support the local prostitutes. He would leave home for days and even months, and Nanny was left alone. Well, Arlie died of heart failure in 1952. Nanny was able to collect on an insurance policy for Arlie's death in the amount of 1500 and another thousand when their home suddenly burned down shortly after Arlie's death. Nanny later confesses that she actually poisoned Arlie, but they just blamed it on heart failure. So Arlie dies, the house burns down, Nanny decides to go visit her sick sister, Dovey. It wasn't long after Nanny's arrival that Dovey became sick and died. Some reports say Nanny went there because Dovey was sick and not that she got sick once Nanny arrived. Maybe she had some type of cancer or something along those lines. But either way, whether she was sick before or after Nanny got there, 
She died shortly after her arrival. So Nanny is again a single woman, a widowed woman. She's looking for a new husband, but this time she joined the Diamond Circle Club of Lonely Hearts. And through this, she met Robert Morton from Emporia, Kansas, and she married him. Robert was not an alcoholic, but he did love the women. And of course, Nanny was frustrated, but she stood by her husband. While she was married to Robert, her mother, Louisa, came to live with them. But Louisa died not long after arriving. She died in January of 1953. And three months later, Nanny's new husband, Robert, died. Nanny later confessed to poisoning Robert, but said she did not kill her mother. Boy, this, uh, I don't know that I'd want to even be an overnight guest at Nanny's house at this point. So if you're losing count here, that was husband number four. Along with one, maybe two grandkids, possibly, and her mom, and I mean, whew. And her sister. And her sister. We're going to have to get a body count at the end of this one. So Nanny's looking for husband number five, and this was the same year that her mother and Robert had died, and she found him, Samuel Doss of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they married in June of 1953. Now Samuel was not like the other husbands. He was not an alcoholic. He was not a womanizer, didn't seem to care for the prostitutes. He was straight-laced, church-going man, and he disapproved of Nanny's infatuation with romance novels. Nanny loved to read romance novels and magazines, and he really didn't like this. It wasn't very godly. Three months after they were married, Samuel was taken to the hospital with a stomach ailment and flu-like symptoms. He was diagnosed with a digestive infection, and he was released. However, on October 5th, shortly after he came home from the hospital, Samuel died. Nanny had two life insurance policies on Samuel. Samuel's doctor told Nanny they needed to do an autopsy. Well, she didn't want to have one done. She just wanted to bury her, her husband and grieve. But the doctor somehow convinced Nanny that an autopsy needed to be done for the life insurance payout. And it was completed. And they discovered he died of arsenic poison. Nanny ended up being arrested for his murder. But once she was arrested, she had already been looking for husband number six. She was in contact with a man named John Kill in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Luckily, he did not meet or marry Nanny. Nanny's luck runs out, I guess, and she's arrested and then questioned by authorities in Oklahoma where she denied killing Samuel. And the investigators noted that she seemed way more interested in reading her Lonely Hearts column in the interrogation room than talking to them. They even took it away from her in order to get her to pay attention to them. And they ended up using the magazine or the Lonely Hearts column as kind of a motivation to get her to talk. She said that if they would let her have the magazine, she would spill the beans. And they agreed. And she upheld her into the bargain. Once she got her Lonely Hearts magazine back, she became cheerful and giggly, according to detectives, and said that she smiled when she confessed. And this is kind of how she got her name that would later become famous in the, in the press, the Giggling Granny. Nanny confessed to these detectives to killing Frank Harrelson in Alabama by poisoning his moonshine. And she told the detectives that with Arlie, Robert, and Samuel, she poisoned them by putting arsenic in their food or their coffee. She told the detectives that she first attempted to kill Samuel by putting the poison in his stewed prunes. But when that only sent him to the hospital, she went back to what had worked before and put it in his coffee. Nanny claimed that she only poisoned the men because they deserved it. But it didn't hurt that she also had life insurance policies on all of the men. Although Samuel Doss was not abusive, he didn't allow her to read the romance novels that she loved so much, and he was very frugal and didn't allow her to spend any money. 
She said she never killed any of her blood relatives and denied killing the two children, her granddaughter, her grandson, her sister, and her mother, but authorities did not believe that that was the truth. Her husbands were exhumed, and some reports say that relatives were exhumed, and only her mother and husband showed arsenic in their system, but others could have died from asphyxiation. So Nanny's charged with murders in Alabama, North Carolina, Kansas, and Oklahoma, but she only actually stands trial for one murder, and that's Samuel Doss in Oklahoma. And in 1955, Nanny decides to plea to those charges and was given a life sentence. While in prison, she worked in laundry and even offered to help in the kitchen, but no surprise here, prison officials wouldn't let her work in the kitchen around people's food. Probably a good plan. Nanny Doll spent 10 years in prison before dying from leukemia. Even though she tried to play it as, oh, my husband was an alcoholic or he cheated or... Nanny was not a battered wife that killed out of necessity. It's obvious that she did so for money. And she had this obsession with seeking the perfect romance novel style of marriage that she just wasn't able to obtain. But she gave it like for what, five or six good tries, I guess. Yes, yes, she did. So that's the story of Nanny Doss or Nancy Doss or Nancy Hazel who was a serial killer, and in the early 1900s is when she began. But I want you to go look at pictures of her. If you're on YouTube, you'll see the pictures pop up. She looks like a granny, like the kind of lady that will make you a homemade baked apple pie and bring you a scoop of ice cream and your sweet tea with lemon on the side. And she's smiling in all these pictures of her. And people do laugh and get giggly when they're nervous or in, at inappropriate times. I've talked about one of my best friends on this podcast before, how you can tell her something just horrific and she's going to laugh. And I'm sure it was more of that than her laughing because she killed these people. But she wasn't a good person. She, you look at her and you want to think, oh, that's like my grandma. No, no. Well, maybe, but I wonder, you know, what do you think about, we've seen cases where there's been some kind of traumatic brain injury. In fact, we even did the Chris Benoit story where we talked about, you know, his wrestling career and if all those repeated blows to his head could have had some influence on how his life turned out. Kind of makes you wonder, and there's no medical and the medical community wasn't advanced enough during this time. But, I mean, wonder if that any of it relates back to that hit in the train car when she was a kid. A very, I, You would think it would have to be a very severe injury. And she never mentioned it requiring hospitalization and stuff. But, but she did say that it had lifelong effects. You know, well, like she that, had headaches and stuff. Yeah, and that's, she blamed it. That's what she blamed her crimes on, that head injury. I mean, we'll never know if it was or not, but... And she said she never killed her blood. She wouldn't kill her blood. But a lot of people died around this woman, in this woman's presence, and in only in her presence, too. Sure. What do you think about the kid with the hat pin? I'm, I don't know. I mean, because it's so old and finding information on that, I'm going to say, why is she going to kill an infant? She doesn't have life insurance or anything on this infant yet. Maybe she wasn't happy with being a grandmother and didn't want her daughter to have another baby. But a hat pin just seems kind of, of an odd way to do it. I mean, if you have a baby and you've just had this baby, suffocation might be a more likely thing she would do. So, I mean, it could be true and it could be one of those things that's just been added over time. That's kind of what I was thinking when... when we first talked about the situation with the hat pin. That's uh, kind of like you mentioned. I guess that's not a very clean way to do it. Seems like it might be easy for a doctor or someone else there to uh, notice that a hat pin, you know, that something sharp had been pressed into the baby's skull. When, as you pointed out, suffocation would be equally as effective and leave a lot less clues i guess i that sounds kind of sensational to me well and old school hat pins 
I don't know if you've ever seen one. They're thick. They're thick right. and they're long, two, three inches long, and and they're thicker than like a, a safety pin you would right. put in your clothing. So it would cause blood, and you would think that that would get noticed that something. So well, I don't and it know. would leave a mark. You yeah. would think it would leave a a pretty discernible mark that something sharp has been poked into this newborn's skull. And another thing that makes me think that it probably was just something that was added over time. You know how we've talked about a parent losing a child, how hard that is in grief, and you need to blame it on somebody. And it very well could have been her daughter, after her mother was found out, said, oh, well, my mother killed my infant. My infant didn't just die. That's a, that's part of the grieving, you know, the denial that, that it's going on. But also... You pointed out earlier a very good point that why, if she even had an inkling this happened, why is she going to leave her toddler son with her mother, who she thought had already killed her daughter? Right. And and we know that, unfortunately, well, fortunately for us now, medical technology has progressed, but we know that the infant mortality rate was a lot higher back then, too. So, Well, and I think this case is interesting, not just... For the fact that it was a, an earlier serial killer, a woman that was a serial killer that started so long ago, but also was born in Blue Mountain, the same place as Marie Hilly, who we know killed by poisoning and moved around the country. If you haven't listened to Marie Hilly, listen to that one. But both of them being from that same very small community and both of them being, I mean, infamous for their crimes is is very interesting kind of makes you wonder if there's something in the water around there sorry for the case this week been a little bit shorter if you can't tell i'm a little bit under the weather so it's hard for me to talk without stopping and coughing every so often but i found this case interesting and i researched it a while back and it seemed like a good time to share nanny doss with the world we hope you enjoyed this week's case and as always we'll see you next week we would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TC Outloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com. 